Bush. And hello, I'm Dr. Tara Peters, and we are the Leadership Doctors. And today, we have another wonderful guest with us today that's a part of our Lessons from Leaders series. We have Dr. Kevin Fagan uh, here with us today. He's president uh, for the system with uh, Nevera College. And so we're delighted uh, to have Dr. Fagan with us today. Welcome, Kevin. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and before I start, uh, Dr. Peters and Dr. Bush, uh, congratulations uh, to you on the success of your book. Uh, I've been seeing the different articles that you've had published and TED Talks or interviews, et cetera. Um, by the time I get done following you, I have no other time to follow anyone else on social media. So just uh, congratulations to both of you. And I'm, I'm so happy uh, for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fagan. We really, really um, appreciate that. And so um, it's great to see you, to be able to hang out with you um, and, and catch up. I miss our time uh, at Northwood. But I know you're doing really, really great things um, with the Barrow. And so Kathy and I are so excited um, to be able to talk to you today, to get your perspective and your insight. And we'd like to really start our conversation today by doing a little bit of level setting. And so um, having um, you to share your, your background, your leadership journey, and then talk about your current role um, as president. Sure, sure. Thanks. Um, you know, as I think about this, for me, uh, my, my leadership journey started when I was in high school and I was a uh, basketball counselor one summer. And I uh, so enjoyed, you know, the coaching and teaching uh, part of working uh, with the, uh, the campers uh, at that time. Uh, but then also was very interested in the leadership opportunity, right? Where how do you coach and teach these individuals uh, the skills and abilities to help them, yet bring them together uh, and accomplish team goals and individual goals? And so I think that really formed uh, uh, the basis on how I pursued both my education and uh, professional career then. So uh, educationally, my uh, undergraduate degrees are in management and marketing, uh, which has certainly uh, helped me from a leadership perspective business-wise. Uh, I went on and got a secondary teaching certificate. Um, I have a master's in educational administration and then a doctorate in curriculum and instruction. So again, that coaching and teaching that I love, but trying to complement that with uh, leadership elements. Uh, professionally, I started as a high school teacher uh, and coach. Uh, from there, moved to the college level and was a college instructor, a college coach, dean, provost, and eventually a president at a four-year private university, uh, and then two years ago had an opportunity to uh, uh, lead a large public two-year college system uh, where I'm at now. You know, in addition, uh, I've chaired and served on a number of public, private, government, nonprofit, civic boards, organizations. So, you know, I, I believe I've got a pretty broad um, uh, and uh, yet encompassing uh, professional uh, leadership journey that's uh, spanned almost 40 years. Uh, just a quick on what I'm doing right now uh, at Navarro College, uh, we serve almost 17,000 students uh, each academic year. Those students come from uh, over 110 counties throughout the state of Texas, 30 states, almost 35 countries. So we're truly an international, global uh, community college. Uh, we deliver programming through adult education, continuing education, career and technical education, and then degree and certificate programs. Um, four campus locations, a very extensive online unit, which became even more extensive about two, two and a half months ago, uh, and a workforce of uh, you know, over 1,500 uh, individuals. So um, uh, that's how uh, I got uh, to where I'm at and uh, the opportunity that uh, I have to work uh, and lead with today. Well, Kevin, thanks for that overview. And um, of course, we've known each other for a little while in a part of that journey, but I uh, learned a lot more about your, your background and other kinds of opportunities that you've had to lead. And so we're really excited to share your leadership uh, views and perspectives and insights uh, with our audience in this interview today. So thanks for giving us that opportunity and, and uh, also those folks who were, will be watching this. So, um, all right, so at Navarro, College, you are, um, you described it as a really large organization that already had some experience or a lot of experience with the online world. And so, um, because all of us are dealing in our different leadership roles and in our different industries with 
the sudden change because of the COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic. I wondered if you could give us just a little bit of an insight about what life looked like as you had to make that quick decision or set of decisions to transition into this um, kind of temporary state, we hope very temporary, and what's going on right now uh, for your organization I, uh, and the people you serve, certainly the students that you serve as well. Yeah, well, I think one of the advantages that I we had was because I, just in my second year, right, still a lot of meetings uh, that we've been having, leadership team, um, uh, and then extension uh, from that. And, and we actually started in January talking about um, uh, the coronavirus and that because it fit in as we were working through uh, all types of other opportunities, right? Um, uh, we certainly did not at that time have any idea that uh, we were on the verge of a pandemic uh, and what that was uh, uh, going to mean uh, for us. But we've been working on our, our culture um, a great deal. And for us, the key elements of our culture are professionalism, empowerment, and trust. Well, talk about the need for those three, right? When this started then, um, if we were going to uh, effectively work with our colleagues and serve our stakeholders, uh, people have to be very professional, right? Because you're working remote, you're not able to uh, do things as uh, normally uh, you would, uh, uh, quote unquote. Uh, people have to be empowered um, because they're not right next to someone or someone may not be available for them. Uh, and I think in order to, to be, uh, to have professionalism and empowerment, you got to have trust, right? Um, uh, without those, uh, I don't know how that occurs. So um, we had met beforehand. Matter of fact, I was just meeting with uh, uh, the chair and co-chair of our uh, faculty association today. And uh, I have lunch uh, with that group um, once a month uh, and meet with the chair and co-chair. And the Friday before our spring break, which we never came back from uh, in essence, I had said to them, and they reminded me that by the fall, one of the goals I had was for us to be able to operate virtually if we needed to. Now that was more in response to, you know, here in Texas, you get tornadoes, right? Inclement weather. Uh, we had a, a, a gas main uh, break before I got here. Now, fortunately, it didn't do large scale damage. It occurred over the break, but you know, so I said, hey, we've got to be prepared to transition uh, that way uh, for uh, at a moment's notice, right? Uh, on types of things uh, along those lines. So we've been having some of those conversations. And then I all during spring break was in touch with the leadership team, um, uh, each day updating them. And then as soon as uh, we made the decision to extend spring break, we were meeting then uh, as a leadership team. So at that time, we've got a a uh, large uh, uh, venue center here. And so we were starting to do some of our social distancing at that point. Uh, so large venue, people spaced out and all that. And really, uh, uh, I don't want to say we were ahead of anything, right? Because, you know, uh, uh, it's the, you know 3.15 my time today and at uh, 4.15 it could be different. Um, but I think we were prepared probably because of what we were just going through with my transition, right? Where we had some things in place that allowed us uh, to extend. Online wise, we had already uh, uh, made that uh, adjustment. Um, we use Canvas, which is the equivalent of what, you know, our previous institution, Blackboard and that. So working with a lot of faculty, faculty understanding that. Uh, I had shared that, you know, if, if we were gonna reach our vision, we needed to be more technologically oriented in that. So, you know, uh, again, that was probably a, a positive for us, just where I was at in my tenure here. So, so Kevin, in, in listening to you talk, of course, we worked together for, for years and, um, and certainly had very close interactions over the, my, the last three years that you were there in my role as, as dean. And so I know your attention to detail and your, your focus on, on planning and engaging people. But you also kind of alluded to the fact that while there were some early conversations going on, the scale of the pandemic, the, the suddenness of the shift, uh, that transpiring um, was, was unexpected. And so I think it's always insightful to, to give a window into what has surprised you um, the most about the pandemic, whether this is something that's a current su surprise that's in, impacting your environment right now, or even as you look ahead, um, to the fall. Um, what, what has been surprising about this whole situation? And it's Yeah, and, and I think it's two things. And, and I, I would say um, that 
surprising uh, and or um, maybe magnifying the importance of it more. You know, so one of the things I think is always important in being an effective communicator is knowing when to communicate and then how much to communicate. And so I think with this opportunity, you know, it was balancing the timing of the communication, right? Because there's so much unknown, uncertainty, continual change. And early on, I was seeing that, right? So we'd have a, a area university or college make an announcement in the morning, and then something came out from the federal government, state government, or whatever, and then they had to change it uh, after that. Um, and so, uh, and I've always been one that, um, uh, while I don't drink wine, um, I think the wine connoisseur letting things breathe, you know, I think that's a, I think that's a good leadership technique, uh, that sometimes you just got to give things a little bit of time, right? Uh, maybe you, you think you know where you're going, or you might even decide it where you're going. But, you know, if I have some time, let me give it a little bit of time uh, on it. And so that's what we found, I found, was boy, and, and there was also no prize to being first either, right? I mean, sometimes if you can be out of the gate first on something and effectively communicate it, uh, you may see some benefits. But in this case here, uh, not seeing that. So, boy, I wrestled back and forth uh, uh, with, well, when to communicate. So we were in touch um, uh, through social media, written communication, that, but most of it was written communication. Initially, what I focused on was just giving them the basics that they needed, right? Because in addition to our transition, we had employees that they don't have daycare now, right? Uh, maybe a spouse uh, was now unemployed or work hours changed. Now they're schooling, and t right? And so I was like, hey, we just got to give them the basics that they need to help them each day with the Navarro portion of it, right? Because they've got all kinds of other things to do. Um, about a month into it, I did a video message uh, to them uh, as a group. Um, we're gonna try and do a district update the first week in June because where our social distancing is in Texas will allow us to do something where they can have questions and answers. But I think that was probably the most, you know, um, again, surprising as you said, just that degree, right? And, and really best with that. And as you said, Tara, I'm usually one very organized and I want to lay everything out too, right? I mean, I want someone to know the whole plan as well as the specifics. And in this case, you didn't know what the whole plan was going to be, right? So we were just kind of moving through. Uh, uh, right now, we have a three phase in to start in the fall. And when I say start in the fall, I don't know exactly what that means, right? Uh, uh, as well, but but following those guidelines. Um, and then probably the other was, again, and not a surprise, you know this as leaders, but during this time, it doesn't matter how much resource you have. If you don't know what you're doing, you're not navigating this time any more effectively than anyone else, right? I mean, you see all these organizations and higher ed, all this resource, and right, they're no further ahead, uh, if that's an appropriate term, uh, than somebody without if they don't have that plan. Yeah, you know, it, it's uh, interesting when you realize that you don't control everything and um, there's a lot of stuff that's unknown and you have to really check yourself, I think, to go, all right, you know, what, which things matter the most, which things can I give up? And, you know, even if we're uncomfortable with it, can we make a good decision now, uh, even if we might have made a different decision with more time? And so I think for all of us, that's been a, a great test of our resilience and our patience and so yeah. Example, yeah. um, for, for sure. All right. So um, a few of the things that you have said so far um, reminds me very much of uh, the things I admire about your leadership style, Kevin. And so uh, to the extent that we interacted at Northwood, uh, one of the things that I was really clear about was that you cared a lot about the human beings, the people that came to work there and the students that were served. And um, as you know, Tara and I have written this book called The Demotivated Employee. So our interests um, in relative to the book and some of the consulting work we're doing is helping leaders see the things that take um, that cause a person who's really really motivated to lose their motivation and um, a lot of times they are uh, things that um, we don't mean to do as leaders but somebody else in the environment might be impacting uh, an employee's motivation and messing with uh, that and seeing their engagement then kind of go down 
And so this is a huge problem. I know you've seen it in your career, and I'm sure that um, the pandemic has caused you to notice people who might be more concerning in terms of their engagement or their motivation than, than perhaps you were concerned before. So if you could talk a little bit about that, um, what, what are you doing at the moment? And what, what are you, where are you philosophically in terms of how to help people when you see them losing motivation? Yeah, um, and I think it's twofold, as you just described, Dr. Bush. I think it's the combination of what's your leadership philosophy, theory, approach, right? I mean, who you are as a leader, and I think that's really important, right? I mean, I think that's one of the things that, as a leader, uh, you have to do. I mean, first, you have to want to be a leader, right, um, a regard. Uh, you have to understand what type of leader you are uh, as well in that. And so, for me, modeling has always been very important, right? And so when we talk about our three cultural components of professionalism, empowerment, and trust, I think helping our employees right now, me modeling those, right? That, hey, I trust you. I mean, I was reading the article the other day that uh, some companies in these Zoom meetings, they're videotaping and you got to check in every five minutes, right? Or they got to see your face or something. So on the one hand, well, I'm going to let you work remote, but if I don't see you all the time, right, uh, on those things. So uh, I felt it was very important for myself and our leadership team to model those things, right, to, to model professionalism, to model empowerment. So we've had different projects where we've said, hey, we need you or this team to go ahead and work on it, right, and, and let us know in a week or something like that, uh, uh, target date back. What are you feeling? Uh, we were surveying our students and in touch with our students, right, as they're making that transition and our different student types because, you know, we have a large dual credit population. So those students that are still in high school, they're home, right? They, they were gone, and, and most of those schools didn't have an online program they were transitioning to, uh, them to like we do. Uh, in that case uh, of it, uh, which is then different than your traditional quote unquote college student and then your adult learners, right? Uh, which are juggling all those things. And, you know, for me, I think the most important part was the trust. Letting them know, hey, I trust you that when you have your time to work on your Navarro College, whatever, that you will do it, right? And it became more about not every day these done, but hey, is this accomplished by the time it needs to be in comp uh, accomplished? So um, I think that's very important. Um, you know, every session I started off with right from the beginning, the first question was, how's everybody doing? H how's your families? How are you feeling? I mean, we didn't even get into work. We just talked about where everyone was at. Are, are we doing what we can. Uh, I always usually ask the question too, are we doing something we think's helping, but it's not, right? That we need to stop doing because that's not helping you. So just, just trying to get a gauge uh, of where they're at um, uh, and, and listening, right? Uh, probably the most important thing that I tried to focus on was, was listening because again, the unknown, the uncertainty, and there was no one to turn to. It's not like we had people in higher ed that'd been through a pandemic before, right? Uh, on things or business organizations, uh, uh, those types of things. You know, there were some things I could compare to like 9-11, the travel piece, right? After 9-11 and did some things, but uh, some of the natural disasters we've had here, the flooding or hurricanes, you know, you could pick that whatever part of the, the country you live in, but not something all encompassing. So uh, I think Dr. Bush and Dr. T Peters, probably the, the most was the modeling, right? So if I was going to expect a, B, and C from my colleagues, they first had to see A, B, and C in me, um, and then engaging them along those lines. So, so Kevin, I mean, all of that um, is so important, um, just as a, as, a, as a matter of leading, and even gets um, uh, magnified, um, as, you, as you've shown, when you're in a situation like this, where the ability to be able to do that um, and to do so in a way that is authentic and people know that that's who you are um, is so important to people. And so uh, I'm just excited um, that we have the chance to share with you and to really kind of pick your brain a little bit more uh, with our audience as we come to a close to really um, get some insight in terms of what are the kinds of things um, that you've done to grow and develop yourself. I know you're a lifelong learner, so I can answer that uh, part of the, the, the question. But I think it would be great for our audience um, to understand 
uh, what are the kinds of things that they ought to be doing? They're going to be in varying stages um, of their career and leadership development. And so hearing from someone that has over 40 years um, of experience um, in a leadership capacity, I think would be really uh, helpful to our audience. Sure, sure. Uh, well, a couple of things. The first is, and I alluded to a couple of those questions, uh, very early on, uh, I can remember my father saying to me uh, these three things in one context or another. One was, you know, you have to want to be a leader, right? I mean, and 24-7, not, okay, I'm going to lead from eight to five and then, you know, check out or whatever. Um, that part. I think the second is you have to understand that there's a price to being a leader, right? Um, and when I say a, a price to it, um, I am Navarro College. I am Navarro College 24-7. I represent all my colleagues, all of our students, all our stakeholders. And many times, that's how I'm referred to or noticed, right? Or, or someone responds, well, that's the president of Navarro College, uh, those type of things. So you have to understand that, the, you know, that responsibility. Um, and I think the third part is leaders don't get to lead or manage in isolation. Meaning that as we go through this, each of our individuals, and rightfully so, are focused on their opportunity, right? Whatever that might be. Um, and that's going to be their lens that they view things through. And, and that's how they'll make decisions or judge things. But I don't have that opportunity, right? I mean, while I'm focused on every one of our individual students, we got 17,000. While I'm focused on every one of our individual employees and their needs, we got over 1,500, you know, uh, on that. So in the end, when I make a decision or the leadership team or trustees, it's not an isolation part of it. And then the second piece is, um, and, I, and I learned this uh, from my, my wife, Liz, who both of you know and just outstanding, is I think it's so important to have the skills and ability to connect with people. Because if you can't connect, and when I mean connect with, know something about them, right? I mean, not just, oh, they work for me and in this department. I mean, know their names, know their families, know their interests. Uh, you know, I like to, the proverbial lead by uh, uh, walking around or manage by walking around, right? I'm in their spaces. I want to be in their offices. Uh, I want to be in their environments. I want to know what they're dealing with, right, and focused on. And so learning how, how to do that, um, I think, is extremely important, you know, that, uh, that connecting uh, with individuals. And so I, I think those two things, for me anyways, answering, kind of answering those three questions, and, and in that case, it's knowing, right, who you are as a leader, or more importantly, who you aren't as a leader, right, uh, also. But then that other piece, and again, I, I learned this from Liz, the, the importance of being able to connect with people. Because if they're, in the end, you know, going to trust you. That first question is, you know, well, what are you, are you in this for you or are you in it for me, right? Right? Is that why you want to know about me? Um, and then do you build a relationship from that and then a partnership and it's all based on connecting. So, um, you know, I don't know if that's good advice or not, but uh, for me, uh, that's what was shared with me and, and I've kind of tried to follow. And again, everything else is important, right? You're going to hear all kinds of individual characteristics uh, uh, that leaders need to have. And I would agree with those, right? And sometimes they vary from the opportunities you're working with also. But those two things for me, they're, they're kind of answering those three questions and then work on your skills and ability to connect with people. And I do that every day, right? I mean, that's a focus every single day for me is connecting uh, with people. So you said a minute ago, you're not sure if it's great advice, Kevin, but I just want to say how awesome the advice is. And, you know, we talk to so many people in our various roles um, as professors and consultants. Um, many of them would describe themselves as being so busy that you know, they want to spend more time with the various people that are stakeholders, but they just don't have the time for it. One of the things that I hear in the lessons and the advice that you provided really is how important and how necessary it is as leaders to, to make that a priority and to spend time with people. So, so again, thank you, Kevin, for, for the time with us. Uh, delightful to see you again and get a chance to chat with you. Um, uh, thank you very much for the advice and the insight that you've given us. And our Well, uh, again, thank you both. And again, congratulations to both of you. Uh, 
you know, when I'm in certain circles, I say, well, I'm friends of Dr. Peters and Dr. Bush. You know, I don't even say my name. I leave with the two of you uh, <laughs> on those things. And so I'm just so happy. And I know the, you know, the time you spent. I know it wasn't like, you know, well, three months ago, let's write a book and we were all done. You know, you spent a few years at it. And, you know, I had some stops and starts again and all that. So just so happy for you. And, and if I could be so uh, bold to say, so proud of you uh, as well. Uh, as colleagues and uh, uh, friends and, you know, the times we've shared and, you know, we've shared some of those demotivated employee opportunities firsthand, right? So, uh, but again, just so happy for you. And thanks so much for uh, including me uh, in this opportunity with you. Uh, it means a lot. Thank you for your feedback. And so uh, for those of you who um, also were inspired by some of the ideas and insights in Kevin's um, lessons from leaders, um, we, <laughs> invite you to come over to our website where you'll find um, Kevin's video of this uh, conversation as well as um, video interviews from other leaders. Uh, so our website is theleadershipdoctors.com. Thank you.